Welcome back to this episode of the Law of Relevancy podcast. Today, my guest is Andy Wilson, someone I've gotten to know over the last couple of years here in Tampa Bay, being involved in the community we've crossed paths, and he's got one of the coolest business in the entire area. He's the CEO and founder of The Quiet Professionals. Andy, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Courts. I appreciate it. You're welcome, man. So we're, I'm pumped to have you here. Uh, first, tell us about the name. What is what is The Quiet Professionals? I feel like I've heard that somewhere before. Yeah, it's, it's, it's ingenious, right? So I've started a, a multiple companies, but this is my second defense contracting company. Mm-hmm. And so I, th- I realized after growing companies over time that, that branding and name recognition is very important. Um, and, and there's a strategy behind picking it. So my thought was, okay, let me come up with something that's really cool. It's going to define kind of the type of business that I wanted to create. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I want to be professional above all else. I want the company to be professional, but also I don't want to be boastful about what we do. It needs to be kind of silent or quiet, quiet professionals. That's great. So the first thing you do is Google it. So what happens when you Google quiet professionals, you bring up special forces or the green beret of which I was one. Okay. So I thought I was genius and come to find out not so much. It was moving around in the gray matter back there and I, I couldn't believe that I chose Quiet Professionals, which, which is the tagline for, for Green Berets. So. See, I would have thought it would have come the other way. I would have thought because of your military experience, you would have said, man, that was one of our slogans. Right. Let me turn it yeah. into a business. You think, but, but it was so great, <laughs> the name, that I started the company. I, yeah. I registered on SunBiz. Mm-hmm. And I go to my first business development meetup at uh, NDIA, local chapter. Yeah. And literally, this was two days after I'd registered the company name. And a guy comes up to me and he says, hey, I'm so-and-so. Who are, who are you and who are you with? And I said, well, I'm Andy Wilson, and I'm the CEO of Quiet Professionals. And he said, oh, great company. Yep, love them. It's terrific. <laughs> like two days old. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you were in the military, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So that, that is kind of interesting. Sometimes you can get hooked in with the right branding to have credibility without even trying. Instantly, yeah. So it's very strategic in picking the right company name. And it really should fit along what business you're you're getting ready to create. So is it even appropriate for me to ask what you guys do there? Yes. Yeah, sure. I feel a little awkward even asking if I'm well, not allowed to. I could tell you. <laughs> But then I'd have to kill you. I can <laughs> I'll cut I, you off there. I yeah, can exactly. I can hint about what we do, and then I just have to maim you a little bit. But we can talk about that after. No, seriously though, we are a defense contracting company, mm-hmm. but we're heavily invested in the technology space, and we're really transforming our company into yeah. into mostly government services, and then now more into the uh, government services, public and private, um, in the in the technology sector. Uh, so we do a lot of classified work for the mm-hmm. U.S. government. Well, speaking in broad terms, I did get to take a tour of your facility. I was super impressed. I think you have six floors or seven floors and one of these high rises over there on Rocky Point. Yeah, we actually have um, five different floors right now. Okay. So just under just just over 60,000 square feet, I think. Wow. Um, but we started really with just about 1,600 square feet uh, in that building in uh, 2015. Wow. But it's the Island Center. I like to call it the Quiet Professionals Building. We finally got to put the sign on the top of the 12-story yeah. building uh, right there. Across from, if you're familiar with the area, um, there's some restaurants uh, that are there. Um, the Rusty Pelican is on our side, and there's also Whiskey Joe's beside and us. And then across the little uh, yeah, Bahama Bahama lagoon Breeze. there is Bahama Breeze. Right. Exactly. So what's that feel like getting your company name put on the side of a high rise? Oh, that was the greatest day of the of the week. There's great days every week, but that was definitely the greatest day of the week, actually, of the year. Uh, it was pretty it was pretty pretty phenomenal for us because you know we started as the smallest business in that building, not knowing if we were gonna make it. Um, and there's companies in that building. There was Arma Global and GDIT. If you're familiar with the companies, bought Arma Global and they have multiple floors in the building and they'd been there for, for a long time, mm-hmm. certainly longer than we had. Uh, so to get to that point where we were the first company to ever brand that building, wow. it's the only company name on there, was pretty a pretty significant milestone for us. Yeah. That's so cool. I mean, I could only imagine riding to work and then seeing up over the horizon come this, you know, one of these tall buildings and it's like, boom, there's mine. That's amazing. Yeah, I wanted to make it a lot bigger, but yeah. unfortunately, due to the the city ordinances, we could only make it as big as we did. So, 
It doesn't stand out as much as I want to, but I watch every morning because it lights up at night and I make sure that it is lit up when I come across a bridge at 4.30 in the morning. Yeah. And uh, and when I leave, I make sure that it's turned on. So. Well, that is definitely something we have in common. I'm also a workaholic. I remember I asked you a couple years ago, I was like, so what do you do? What's your, what are your hobbies? He goes, I like to work. It's like, oh no, I mean like, but when you're not working, it's like, no, that's all I do. It's all I want to do. I want to yeah. build this really successful company. Yeah, exactly. So that we can help humanity, right? There's so many things out there yeah. to do. Well, speaking of helping humanity, um, you're all over the place. I, I see you at different community events, and you uh, have recently created a film that highlights um, police work and we, some of the stuff that goes on inside the police force. Yeah, we did. So um, the the concept behind the film was to create awareness with PTSD inside of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Since you're aware, probably there's a lot of, of news media and coverage around post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder around military, you know, military coming yeah. back from combat and come back from war. But a lot of people don't realize with our law enforcement, uh, local, state, and federal, uh, not just law enforcement, but first responders as well. Yeah. They're, they're, experiencing traumatic events on a on a very regular occurrence going out to car crashes and seeing mangled bodies and, and dealing with that or dealing with shoot no shoot scenarios or they god forbid they have to actually shoot someone in the line of duty and these things that occur like consistently uh and it and it wreaks havoc on a person and and some people have some very difficult times at handling that um and so it was a you know, it was inspired by me uh, through one of um, one of my senior executives that we had for a while. But uh, there's a there's kind of a uh, some stories behind that, and and, and really, a, it's really based on a, a true life story of somebody that that went through these events. And AK runs a production company in St. Petersburg, and my thought was, um, hey, let's let's in, instead of going out and finding a bunch of people that that we can try and raise money to, to actually get this film into production. Yeah. Which I hate asking people for money. We get asked for money all the time. Um, I'd rather support it. And it's just, just not something that I like to do. Well, it's interesting though. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just stop sure. right there for just a second. Bookmark your thought. <clears throat> Having been in a little bit of the filmmaking world myself, when you make a film, it's almost, especially like an independent film, you have to be willing to whatever money you put into it, you may get nothing back. Oh, 100%. So, so putting the money into it, I knew going in that there's nothing that's going to come out of it. And so yeah. I actually, you know, the, the estimate doubled in cost by the time we finally decided that we were going to pull the trigger and, and getting my wife to agree and so forth. And I, I wasn't going to be able to do it on my own. I actually reached out to a friend of mine that was a client as well and, yeah. and told him about it and the philanthropist and was very interested and so he agreed to split the cost and wow. you know, we both actually invested um you know a significant amount of money um to have it done and never produced a movie before certainly not a full-length feature mm -hmm. and so um that process was pretty cool and we got we got terrific assistance from the st pete uh, police department pasco county uh, and, and some in Hillsboro, but yeah. we got to use, you know, some of those facilities. We had to pay for a lot of that stuff on our own. The yeah. actors, we flew a lot of actors in from various different places from LA to, to, uh, Atlanta and different, different places across the country. Um, but it, it was, it was, it was awesome watching it, um, in the making. And then yeah. actually that the pre and post production, it was just amazing. And so we aired that and now it's actually entered in, in, uh, film festivals across the country, but the latest one is going to be the St. Pete Film Festival uh, actually this weekend. I think it's airing uh, this Friday. And the um, name of the film is 115 is Grains? 115 Grains, right, which is the amount of uh, gunpowder that's in a 9 millimeter uh, bullet jacket. And so that's where the name came from. Wow. But, but pretty awesome. If you get a chance to watch it, I would highly recommend it. And uh, it, hopefully soon we'll find a distribution channel and we'll get that out there. But really, again, the whole reason for production was really to bring awareness um, to PTSD and law enforcement and hopefully uh, help to create opportunities for uh, men and women and first responders and law enforcement to have an opportunity to get some relief. I like the way you do that. You... Um... <clears throat> If you follow Andy Wilson on LinkedIn, you'll see that you're involved in your film. 
you have uh, you're raising awareness about post traumatic stress. And a lot, I like to call it just post traumatic stress, not a disorder, because it's not like you're born with it. You know, a lot of you acquire right. it, right? Right. And then there's uh, a, a lot of work you do with trafficking of human trafficking with your skull games. And, you know, of course, I've seen you at different community events, giving back to the community. I mean, it seems like you're very, very involved. Yeah, I like to stay active in giving back. This, the Skull Games is actually not mine. All Things Possible Ministries runs that, and it's a, it's a, great, it's a great event, and they, they've been doing some tremendous oh. good. We just hosted them a few oh. times at, at our facility. Okay. Uh, and actually, they just ran one this weekend at a place just outside of McDill Air Force Base. So I know they had great results. Um, but, yeah, we're very passionate about that. Uh, as part of my company, Quiet Professionals, we acquired a company called Echo Analytics Group, which is an open source intelligence company. And those analysts are very good um, at, at tracking down information about um, people, places, and things anywhere in the world, anytime. And the lay version of that is they're the best at Googling anything. Uh, yeah, it's a little beyond Googling. Yeah. So it's, it's like uh, deep research on um, the dark web, the deep web, wow. uh, and internet searches and anything else of, that, that has publicly available information. Mm -hmm. But being able to use tools and techniques to be able to really dig in and do deep research. Phenomenal opportunity for people to take courses and understand what um, open source intelligence or publicly available information research is inside of places like colleges or and the or acronym any is OSINT. OSINT stands for Open Source Intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, people uh, in the private sector might might call it Open Source Information or yeah. de or Deep Research. And so, building a researcher that understands how to use these open source intelligence techniques, um, it really gives advantages to businesses, advertising, uh, and certainly for you know law enforcement agencies across the country, across the world that are looking for uh, the opportunity to solve various different cases. So human trafficking, of course, we all know is a huge problem. Uh, more light, thank God, has been shined on the epidemic uh, as of late. Um, but, but training folks on how to become op open source intelligence analysts is a big help to law enforcement you know, across the country, across the world, certainly across the state. And they can reach the Echo Analytics company in order to learn how to do that and to take some exactly courses. yeah they can take online courses they can come and take in-person courses right at our facility on on rocky point um but um yeah echo analytics um it will lead you to that website and uh if, if people are interested what makes something open source open source is anything that's publicly available and, does that and, mean that you can buy it you either have to buy it or it's just sure out there on the if web. you can buy it then it's publicly available you may have to pay for it or it's you know it's open source information anybody that has access to the internet certainly can reach it or books or library or papers or any kind of publication so what would be some information that's that's not open source um do you have a personal drive at your house where you keep data that nobody else can see that would not be open source information gotcha. now if you had hackers that could come in and get into your system at home and tie into this hard drive or, or something mm -hmm. and you had that saved information, it's still public or it's still private information. Yeah. But it could be stolen. And that's <clears throat> not what open source intelligence analysts or uh, folks would be out there to do. How many of those not. databases that you guys are using are databases that like the police department would have or would have act it depends on what our client base is. Like we have some law enforcement agencies that that will um that will contract us to do some work for them. And, and when we do, there may be some type of a memorandum of understanding where we'll have access to one of their databases. Gotcha. That are not, those would not be publicly available um, databases, but certainly ones that the analysts could then go in and source information from for, for, you know, cases that they might be working on. Yeah. So one of the things I learned about you a while back was that you're also involved in another company called Scion Analytics. Yes. And what I thought was really cool about that with you being involved in, you know, trying to win government contracts was you needed a really efficient way to respond to those RFPs. Right. Yeah. It's pretty interesting uh, technology. So that was another company that we acquired back uh, about two years ago. Um, but the technology, the software itself is really, it's a, it's a, it's an engine like Microsoft Excel would mm -hmm. be. Um, but really on the surface, it, it, it's pretty simple. But in the background, what it does is it takes any type of document and it parses that document, but it also can, can spit out um, um, uh, compliance matrix 
or an outline of, a, of what you would respond to in a proposal. Yeah. But it, it, um, it focuses on pulling out keywords, phrases, and sentences that are going to match the criteria that you put in using a dictionary that is custom or one that you can, you can build for it. So the practical application is? The practical application is if you are, if you are responding to any type of a proposal um, put out by the government or, or any private industry, that is reaching out for bids and you have to do a response to that. And there are certain criterium that, um, that you have to abide by in order to win that work with a government proposal, for instance, if, if, if the government says the contractor shall, or the contractor will, or the contractor must do certain things inside of this proposal, if you are not if you do not respond to that particular item inside of that request for proposal, then you become non-compliant. With the government, they, they get so many responses to a lot of these proposal requests that as soon as they hit one non-compliance, they throw it out without looking at the rest of the document. They have to from a from a legal standpoint. So it's it's critical that you that you are in compliance and you respond to each each part of that uh, request for proposal. And some of these proposals can be hundreds of pages long. And so essentially what you're doing is you're saving time. So an analyst that would have to sit and look uh, that was doing a response to proposal that would normally take three days to put together a compliance matrix can now do it in a matter of minutes. That's amazing. Yeah. And but what I like about hearing about that business and what you've done is you seem to be really quick and good at hooking into businesses and things that are going to benefit you and can provide scale. And so <clears throat> my understanding is you use the tool, you like the tool, and you said, hey, I'm in the business of winning government contracts. Boom, I'm going to be the most efficient at winning these things, and it's really going to help propel your business. That's right. Not just my business, but all businesses. And then yeah. the thought was, because licenses are fairly expensive, $5,000 a year for, for a user to use the full uh the full power of the of the entire program. So what we did was we pulled a piece out of it and we call it uh, docuparse.com. Yeah. And on there, you can do just a single document for $9.99. That's so you amazing. can parse any document you want. It will show you an example of what it's going to look like. You can download it for $9.99 and you have it. So now small businesses have the opportunity to do, to save time and do that, that, compliance work at a much faster scale, the same as a large business wow. would at a much lower cost because they're not doing the volume of responses probably that a, that a large business would be. So, so we've done that. Um, but technology is important. Technology is important in the business. You know, traditionally when we started quiet professionals, we were just a government services, uh, provider. So we would go out and bid on contracts for the government and we call it butts and seats type contracts. Yeah. So we would get, you know, a contract to provide, you know, three full-time employees for SOCOM for five years yeah. for X amount of dollars. And we would, we would simply go out and source those. I used to call it, we're a high-speed staffing company. Yeah. So we'd find those folks, we'd, we'd employ them, we'd put them on contract, they work in those positions. And then hopefully when the five years is up, we win the recompete and we, we employ the same people or different people for the same amount of time. But what I realized over time is I'm starting to, you know, inside of our CEO council even, and I'm meeting with other business owners around, um, around the area or in the greater Tampa Bay area and around the state and the country. In fact, as you start, um, growing in your business knowledge and you're looking at things and you're trying to constantly analyze and, and reinvent and grow and move to the next level. What I realized is I had somebody actually at one of my council meetings and they, they were complaining because they were a technology company and they just, uh, they were making, I think you said it was like 35% margins on whatever uh, software he was selling at the time. And I was like, you're complaining about 35% margins. You got to be kidding me yeah. in the government services space. You know, you're lucky to, you know, you're hitting between three and, and 10%. If you're lucky, you're hitting 10% yeah. on, on most contracts in, in, in the space. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking I'm in the wrong line of business. I mean, we're yeah. doing all this work for that. Now, granted we do volume work. Um, but if I can be making, cause he said, you know, generally speaking, you're making 40 to 80% margins wow. with software. And so the thought was, wait a minute, there's something to this and technology. Of course we know technology is really moving so fast. So a few years back, that's what I looked at. And I thought, man, if I'm going to grow to this size to a billion dollar company, I'm going to have to really dig my head into this technology space. 
Well, and famously, the most recent relevant thing that came out about technology lately has been ChatGPT4. Indeed. Which is this, one of the scariest things. It was so <clears throat> awesome to see your podcast and you were yeah. talking about ChatGPT4 and what you did and, and, and having, uh, having that AI answer about itself mm -hmm. and then put it into a song with a genre, the country genre. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I think you said Garth Brooks, I think it was, it, right? It's amazing. It's amazing what it can and do. And create a song <clears throat> right there in front of you while you're talking to it. And it, yeah. it gave me ideas. And the, the reality is we're only limited to yeah. our imagination on how to frame the question. Right. And where is it actually going to go? That's right. And to realize, and I think it might have been you that coined this on your podcast, we're in a space and time right now that it is comparable to the Industrial Revolution. And some people would argue that, that we're in a, in a spot that's actually even greater right. in the history of humankind than was the Industrial Revolution and what that did to the global economics. Um, so, yeah, and I, I, I fully believe that any company or organization that has not realized this at this point and embraced it or is embracing it now is going to fall woefully behind uh, because woefully. the advantages of using this this advanced brain if you will is uh it can't it can't be understated i mean it's 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 amazing i'm getting like do. twice the work done today than i got done a month ago it's incredible and so as we're like personally, building out, personally, yeah, yes, exactly. As we're, as we're building out, uh, the team, you know, I started building out a, a, a software development team, uh, inside the organization and bringing in some really smart people, former Microsoft executives and, you know, uh, a, a bunch of technologists from all over the place. And, and it's great these days too, because you had all these big tech company layoffs. So now it's not as hard to find these really great people right. and bringing that, that, uh, that brain trust together inside of quiet professionals, the organization and starting to build the solutions that we need to for our clients right. globally is, it's pretty awesome. And, and now as we start building in and taking advantage of, um, you know, AI and machine learning products and, and building out those, um, those scripts that we need yeah. to use to, to take advantage of what it is that we're trying to do to satisfy customer requirements. It's, it's pretty awesome. What are some of the that. prompts that you've given it that you've been just shocked that it could do? <laughs> Man. So I, I thought the other day, you know, I was telling the team, you know, we're going to build a futures lab and what we're doing to create new technology. And if you've read the book zero to one and understanding like it's, you got to have a new concept. It's not just building them. Yeah. Many inventions are built on existing products, just making them better yeah. to, to come up with a true zero to one product. Um, like the telegraph was, or the telephone was, yeah. or, or a cell phone was, you know, those are zero to one products. Even though I just said telegraph, telephone, yeah. cell phone, those are really still building on, you know, something that was, was previously done, at least yeah. the concept or idea. Um, but my thought was, okay, I've got this idea to, to, uh, we've met these guys that, that run this nonprofit called 220. Yeah. They're now starting a for-profit, uh, called anxiety guys and, and they're brilliant. And really they, they can sit down in a short session and, and, and help. They've helped thousands of people, um, with their PTSD or anxiety or depression yeah. in just one session for 20 minutes and get rid of it forever. It's amazing. Yeah. So as I talked to him, I came up with this idea as I'm going through and I'm like, man, you know, we could, you guys need to build this. You need to be able to replicate yourself in every language, everywhere around mm -hmm. the world. So why not create an avatar that's AI driven with an AI brain that will be able to do what it is that you can do and put it in and make it, it'll be 10 times better by the time it's done learning right? to be able to do the same thing so that it can then be the counselor that can sit and talk with people that want to do this at home or anywhere that they That's want brilliant. anywhere in the world. Because it's using rapid eye movement, right? So it can use computer vision to look at that too. And it can respond based on what your responses are and what you're doing. Right. So, so finally we do this. Pong has come back, right? We do this in every yeah. language globally and, and we take away depression, anxiety, all these other ailments that people have everywhere in the world. And what is that going to do to society? It's going to make a, a much better, right. not utopian society, but we're getting there. But you look at that. So what I did was I go into chat GPT and I say, yeah. okay, here's my concept. Write me a business plan. Exactly. 
because I'm lazy. I don't want to do the work. So it literally wrote a business plan. And then what, what I did was I just started taking out pieces of it. It's, you know, it's talking about doing the market research. And I said, well, go do the market research. Exactly. So it does that for me. And it's amazing. It's like you have your own worker that's so well-versed. It can do any of this research that you want just by typing in the right question. I still find that I'm needing to like tweak it seven to 10%, you know, but it's still amazing. Like, like when I first saw what it could do, I didn't sleep. Like I had very well for like two days. It's amazing. Right? I was, I was terrified. I was inspired. I was like trying to figure out like, how am I going to use this? And, uh, and I've had some really interesting uses for it. Everything from, Hey, I need to write an email that covers this, 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 and this, it needs to do this. It needs to do this. So where my prompt is four sentences long, and then the email that it writes is better than something I could have written on my own, and it's, you know, 500 words long. And it's thought about things that you haven't thought about, which right. inspires you to think in another direction exactly. that you wouldn't have. You don't have to do that, that initial hard work, but it, the responses that it gives you, this the is what I find. The pencil to paper is unbelievable. And, it, and it, it's very well written. It's very well versed. Right. And that's just one AI so there are a bunch of other AIs that are being created out there. Mm -hmm. But what I really need at this point is when is it that I can then have an AI for myself that I can containerize, that I can give it the data that I access to the data that I want it to have. Like your Slack channel. Like exactly. here's every conversation I've had in the last four years. Here's how I would respond sure. to it. What do you, you know? There's so, there's so many things that can be done. But yeah. as we look at it, you know, more importantly, as importantly, probably is, is security uh, cybersecurity, cybersecurity mm -hmm. inside of the space. Everything now is, is technology. Everything is tied together. Everything is openly available and hackers are getting really good and hackers are using AI to get better at hacking. Oh, I'm sure they can do a really good job. Like here's a person's social media profiles, guess their password. You 100%. Know? Well, think about, think about more so when you look at, um, facilities that are, that are managed with critical infrastructure across mm -hmm. the entire world. From right. water supplies to, to nuclear plants, um, to industrial facilities, and the ability to actually hack because they are all online in some shape, form, or fashion with, with very you know, sophisticated encryption algorithms that are, that are keeping those right. generally hackers out. Or the banking system, the global banking system, yeah. um, the global trading systems, Wall Street, you know, think about that. And as we start looking at that's why this, you know, cybersecurity is so critically important. And with AI coming in, there's so many factors that we have to think about Yeah, that we have to try and stay ahead of to keep those that would do us harm at bay and to stay one step ahead. I want to, I want to figure out a way <laughs> a couple years ago, someone was able to successfully get a phishing email is somehow into my organization. <clears throat> and I was thinking, it's so easy. Like, we'll just look and see what IP address is. Let's look at the email thread. Let's see where it came from. Let's trace that, trace that. Let's go DNS attack, you know, that IP address. Let's go figure. Like, I want to go on offense when these people do these things. And you think that, but most of those that are coming in are sophisticated enough that they're using virtual machines and oh, other sure. things where they're hopping around where you're never going to know where they actually originated yeah. from. And that's another thing you look at. There are, there are companies that are specifically designed to help. Your most vulnerable point into your yeah. system is a human interface. So it, it is those phishing emails. Yeah. To be able to attack a network is, is getting somebody in your organization. And I think these days we've all had it. Anybody that's had a business for more than, you know, some short period of time that has, you know, uh, some number of employees has experienced a phishing email. And some have even had employees, you know, I have instances where I've had yeah. an employee go to the 7-Eleven to buy these oh my gosh. gift cards. And they're saying that they want them to scratch them off the back as an email from me. Oh, my you God. Know, supposedly. And, uh, and fortunately, uh, the person that was doing it, it's actually an executive. This was, this was a few years ago, wow. called me and said, Hey, did you really want us to scratch these numbers and give them to you? <clears throat> oh, and I was, I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. What in the like, world? We're, I'm about? like, you got to be kidding me. You are not actually, you have not actually purchased $500 of gift cards. Have you? And the answer was, yeah, well, that's what your email said to do. And I said, 
it certainly wasn't my mill. No, but the whole thought behind that is is a company our size now. Of course, we have we have penetration testers. We have people inside the company that are actively probing our own company, putting together these systems. And there are companies like No Before, which is a local company that you know is now a multi billion dollar company that went public, and it looks like they they may sell again to a private entity. Um, but that's specifically what they do. So you can actually pay them; they'll come in. And uh, and they'll create a program for your company, and they'll they'll red team your company. They'll send out emails, and it's it's you know based and around your company. People and might not understand what red teaming a co- your sure, company. Sure, red teaming is is so now you've like you've got uh, simulated hackers in this case, and the hackers would be the red team. The blue team would be the good guys. The red team would be the bad guys. So the bad guys come in and try to attack your network and get in and But and they're on your malicious. payroll, so they're not truly they're trying to cause you. So you they're not truly doing it. You're paying them to do this. And yeah. so the great thing about like no before is you'll click on a link. One of your employees will at whatever level they click on it. And it is, you know, it's, it's up. Oh, we got now the skull and crossbones pop up and then it immediately brings you to a training session. And you're required yeah. to do the training session and it teaches you That's cool. not to do that. So yeah. great, great company, you know, great idea, great concept. But oh, we got to look at this more and more because, you know, and, and where are these hackers going to really put forth their greatest efforts? Probably not going to be with the small mom and pop companies. Yeah. It's going to be the larger company before they can actually extract, you know, cash or information. Uh, but at volume... Globally, especially with with the invention of AI and what what these hackers are now right. getting so sophisticated in doing, now they can do these attacks at volume, and and get results that are you know very meaningful. So how do we protect ourselves at the lowest level? And that's something that you know that's one thing that I'm passionate about is to be able to forward think about this, understand as much as we can, bring in the best and brightest because I certainly can't. Can I do tell it. you what I've done last time Please. two times? Yeah. So. Uh, I get the classic phishing email. It's a fake invoice. And it's like, hey, you know, just please wire the, if the, you know, wire the payment here. And so I knew what it was before I opened it. I double checked. I scanned the file before I opened it to make sure it wasn't going to run some program on my computer. And so I was able to open it safely. <clears throat> and then what I did is I looked at the routing number and the checking account number. And I said, okay what bank is that routing number? So it's like Chase or it's, you know, some bank out in Midwest or Ozark, whoever it is, right? And so then what I did was I used my consume, my, uh, my paid open source, like a Zoom info type of a database. Mine's called seamless.ai. So I can find practically any business professional in the world, what their email address is, phone number, whatever. So then what I do is I I send then a mass email to everybody on the fraud team at like Chase Bank, like including the VPs, the executives, the whoever. And I send them like, hey, this account number with this, you know, this routing number, this account number sent me this. And I'll take like a safe screenshot, like a JPEG of the invoice for them. And I was like, hey, you might want to investigate that. And every time I do that, it like gets quiet with phishing emails for like a little while. But it's really? very satisfying. It's very satisfying to be able to just turn them direct because you know that like the people at the bank are going to be able to look up and see who's it. Right. That is right, and they're gonna they're gonna put the full force of the fraud department behind it. Exactly, because I've just put them all on notice. Right. And that's a brilliant idea. Mm-hmm. It's a brilliant idea. So that's been fun. You could almost build a business around that, where Somebody you offer might, that to even. other folks, right? Exactly. Well, there's an <laughs> idea for you. Just uh, well, that's give I me a little this, sugar if you use it's it. It's funny, you know, starting a business, I tell people, I talk to people all the time about yeah. starting businesses, any type yeah. of business. Um, but really, it's all about, it's really all about the people and the drive and, you know, who the person is. You yeah. know, there's different types of businesses. There's lifestyle businesses, and then there's growth businesses for exit. Um, so tell me about you. So let's get back to the Andy Wilson story sure. for a second. So what inspired you like give us a little information on your background um what what makes andy who andy is? ah good question uh, my mom did because she gave birth to me no that's not in entirely maine. true so she gave birth yeah. to me in maine right so i grew up in maine um uh, parents were divorced when i was young i think i was seven um you know, I was, a, I guess I was an AB student. We, we didn't have, we didn't have much growing up. I, I worked, I probably worked, started working at the age of 
nine, Mm -hmm. 10. I mean, we always worked. Um, I got to the point where I really wanted to get out of the state of Maine. I, I, I also felt like work was important and, and you have like and, a moose allergy or something. School, no moose allergy. Now maybe cold allergy over time, you know, that's, that's real. Uh, I think, yeah. And I think it's more just the slush and, and nasty streets yeah. and all that crap that you grew up with. Um, <clears throat> but no, I, I really, I felt like, you know, there was more to the world than, than Maine. And so I dropped out of school in 10th grade out of high school and I joined the military. One day I woke up and I had this epiphany that I Can just, we just stop for a second? Sure. So you dropped out of high school. I did. Yeah. What was that tipping? Like what happened where you felt like, cause you're a smart guy. Like I, what made you think that like, Hey, this is, this is a really wise thing to do. I'm going to drop out of high school. The kids in high school made me crazy because I just felt like they were so young and naive. It, it really bothered me over and over again. And the teachers you feel like you're wasting your time? I felt like I was completely wasting my time, especially when I was working and the people that I associated with were all pretty much 10 years my senior. Um, and even them, you know, many of them, I felt like it, it just drove me crazy. I was ready to grow up too fast, I think. Yeah. Um, I think that's really what drove me. Uh, and I didn't think I could get anything else out of high school what, than what I'd already gotten. How did gotten. you drop out? Did you just not show up one day? Uh, I actually went in to see the principal with my father. And, uh, and of course, as I was dropping out, he told me, if you leave school, you're not going to amount to anything. And, um, and my, my father, although he didn't agree with me doing it when the, when the principal told him that he was like, don't be so sure. And and we walked out. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I was his, I was his kid and that's the way he felt about it. So anyway, we walked out of there and, and that was it. And I just went to work. And then uh, I got a GED the next week. Um, so I had equivalent of a high school diploma. And, uh, and I worked. And then one night I went to bed and I realized when I woke up the next morning, I, I really wanted to get out of there. And I had this epiphany that I'd simply join the military. I knew nothing about the military when I joined. And in fact, I went the first place was to the Marine recruiter thinking that that, that was the hardest thing to do. because when I look at you, I think prototypical military guy. Yeah, so I, I thought, man, I'm going to the Marines because that's like the hard thing to do, not knowing yeah. anything about it. Um, I couldn't get in because they wouldn't accept GED at the time. So I went to the Army, and the guy, the recruiter, framed it like a business. He's like, imagine this is a business and the, the pie, and you know, he sliced out the size of the Marine Corps and the Navy and the Air Force and, and then the Army, the big one. And he said, yeah. where do you think you're going to get promoted the fastest and make the most money. And I was like, huh, okay, I'm in the right place. Uh, so I joined, um, as soon as I turned 17 and I went, uh, my first duty station within Germany and I was a, a combat signaler, um, really a thankless job, I guess. I quickly uh, became the commander's driver in an MP company, a military police company over there. And then, um, had the opportunity to sign up for special forces, uh, a year and a half in, and uh, I didn't think I could do anything like that. So I, I raised my hand, signed up. Somebody so you're was, 18 and a half. I was 18 and a half, right. Signing yeah. up for the special forces. Yep. So I, I, I got on a plane and I flew to Fort Bragg and I went through the selection process and I made it. Um, it was very exciting. I got back over and uh, that started my career you in special forces. You must have been forces. one of the youngest Green Berets of all time. Uh, no, actually, they, are, they have a program called the 18 X-ray program where people can come in directly out of high school uh, and, and directly into the military and try to make Now, it's very difficult at an 18 X-ray program to make it through the first time, um, but there are folks that do it. But what I did was I, I got on a special forces team. I became a Green Beret. I, I joined 3rd Special Forces Group. And, uh, it wasn't really what I thought it was going to be. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't as exciting as I wanted. And back then in 1990, 91 timeframe, there wasn't a whole lot going on unless you were in seven special forces group, which covered South America. And there was a lot of drug activity going on, uh, for those guys. But for us, we had sub-Saharan Africa at the time as our geographic location. But that heated up pretty quickly. Uh, not not in those days. There wasn't a lot going on. That, that, not that the U.S. was involved in with with I the first Gulf War. Yeah, so the first Gulf War happened, but when that was going on, I was I was in that school going through the selection process. Gotcha. So it's just before I got to third group. Um, 
So anyway, I got there. I, I then tried out for the, um, the combat dive detachment. So I got to go to, to combat dive school, scuba school down in Key West, which was pretty awesome. And we had special forces instructors and Navy SEAL instructors to certify. And it was, it was pretty yeah. gratifying getting through that, that process. Um, of course, jump school and dive supervisor. And then I, I still realized it still wasn't what I thought it was. And then um, there was a classified unit that, that did some recruiting. And um, I raised my hand for that to give it a shot. And I went to that selection process, which was, which was very, very difficult and very eye-opening. And I think that was something that, that definitely had um, a, a massive impact on my life and shaping me to make me understand more about who I was and what I was capable of. Can you dig into that a little deeper? It's really the, the selection process there um, puts you through isolation, um, it gives you tasks, puts you on your own, and really makes you think about uh, yourself and not understanding uh, as you're going through the process what the requirements are. They simply, you know, they use land navigation to do that. They use um, yourself and you're relying on yourself to do that. So, so they use land navigation to help uncover things about you? Sure. If you've ever done a land navigation <clears throat> course on your own where you're given a point and a map and a compass and told, uh, here's your next location, go to that location, but you're on your own to do it. And it's maybe 10 miles away through the mountains and you, you've got, you know, a backpack on and a, and a, and a weapon and you've got to move from one location to the other. And you're in the middle of the woods and you really, you get lost. You don't know where you are. You really got to start using your own faculties because you start thinking about, well, it's at night or maybe it's really cold outside or whatever the case is going on. How far are you going to make it if you get lost? Are you going to quit? Are you going to send a flare up or use the emergency radio to get picked up? You know, you're, you're fighting all these demons in your mind. You go through all these things. And then over time you get maybe sleep deprived, your body's breaking down. Um, and, and really you're having to dig inside yourself, but this process really, it's, a, a, the selection process runs through weeks of, of doing this. Um, and you're not told anything other than, you know, take your information from the chalkboard, you know? And so in your mind, you're like, man, that's am so I, cool. And you, so you show up, you show up to try out and you're like, you walk in, there's like a chalkboard or maybe a little bit of an orientation. And you're left to kind of figure it out. You're, you're left to figure it you're, you're doing exactly what you're told to do, no more, no less. And they're not going to give you any more information. So, so it's really, it's very basic, uh, but it really makes you dig inside yourself because you, you don't know what the distances are necessarily. You don't know if you've already failed or if you made it or if they're just testing you a little further and then you're not going to make it and you're going to drop out or you're going to quit. Yeah. Um, and so it's pretty awesome. So by the time you're done, it really breaks you down into that your body is physically, your body's broken down. And at that point, then you have the hardest part of the challenge, uh, which is the longest, the longest movement. And it's, it's a significant movement more, you know, the distance is longer than, um, it, it, it's a significant distance. And so, uh, when you're out there and you're already broken, and you're told now you've got the, and you know, you've got this long distance to go. You don't know how long it is, but it literally takes you, you know, 24 to 48 hours uh, of constant movement and you're, you're broke. And so I remember when I started out, I was released and I, it was extremely foggy. It was so foggy that night that you couldn't, you could use a knife and cut that air in front of you. You couldn't see more than a few feet in front of you. And this particular time we were able to use, we were supposed to stay on this trail. Only you couldn't see the trail after you got released because it was at night. It was like two in the morning and I got released and, and I started up this mountain and I knew I was off the trail and I get up part way up this mountain and I hit what's called mountain laurel. And if you don't know what that is, it's like vines. Like you think about um, vines that are four to six feet above the ground and you're walking a big thick wood vines and uh, you're walking above that. And so I was, I knew I was in the mountain laurel and I was going up and I was trying to get up to the crest at the top of the mountain and come back down the other side, but I couldn't see anything. I was exhausted. I was broken. And this was, this was the first point. Reminds me of like scuba diving somewhere where it's pitch dark, where 
you you have you're trying to sometimes see the direction of the bubbles, right? Right. Then you know that's up, right? Because you're disoriented. So I remember, and I knew this was the first point out of many, many, many points that I had to do, and I was so I was hours behind. And I remember falling into the mountain laurel and I was trapped because my rucksack was stuck on the vines and my weapon was stuck and I'm looking up and I'm probably four feet, you know, not underwater, but under these vines. And I can see up through and the fog was kind of clearing and I could see the moon up there. And I just laid there and I thought, man, I'm not, there's, I don't have any more. There's no, there's no way, there's no way I can ever make it. It's impossible. And at that point I was, I, you know, and I don't often pray and certainly not at the time. I was like, God, if you have a hand in this, like, help me to get out of here. Show me, show me what I have to do. And I feel like at that point I had this inspiration that is indescribable. And I came up out of Laurel and I got out of that, that spot and I started running and I ran for the next more than 30 miles nonstop. And I got to the end <clears throat> and I got brought back to where the barracks were and there were only five guys there. And we started with 243. And I was like, man, where is everybody? And they're like, we're it. We're the only ones that made it. And I was like, no, I, I didn't make it. My feet, I remember, my, I didn't have anything on the bottom of my feet. They were all blood, no feet, left, you know, no skin left on them. I'm like, I, I didn't make it. I'm like, trust me, if you're here, you made it. Couldn't believe it. And then uh, I remember going to the airport after that, and they welcomed me into the, into the unit. They said they were going to take a chance on me because there's more mental part they have to go through. And I remember walking to the airport, and I just looked around, and I realized, I'm like, man, nobody here understands anything that's going on out here, anything that, that, that I've just been through. Like, it doesn't matter. From this point forward, nothing else matters what, what I do. I just realized something about myself that it's, it's all heart. It doesn't have anything to do with your physical capability, your mental capability to be able to stay the course and understand. And I find that's the same thing in business. You've seen this. I, I, anyone that has a business for any amount of time has seen it. You go through these chaotic states, these times where you're like, how can I do this? We're not going to make it. But it's at those times that really true leadership and stamina stands out. It's those times that really define you. It's those times that are going to show you whether you're going to be successful or not. Right. But you got to understand that you're going to constantly, there are constant cycles of that. It's, it's going to happen again. You're constantly being tested. <clears throat> you just got to make it to that next little waypoint. Exactly. And you just got to keep trying. Indeed. And it'll eventually work out as long as you have the heart. It does. It definitely disappoints me sometimes when I see people who have the ability to get there. And for whatever reason, they just. They just quit. They just quit. So for me, you know, when I started um, Quiet Professionals. My thought was I wanted to create something that was like that special mission unit that I was in for so long. And I say that because it was, it was a place like nowhere else in the world. And I know a lot of people clearly can't experience this and it's difficult to describe because I can't really go into detail about it. But what I can tell you is it was a place that was so on the edge, on the tip of the spear all the time that the first thing you want to do every morning is to get there. And the last thing you want to do at the end of the day was leave before anyone else because you didn't want to miss anything. And this was every day constant. Or let your teammates down. Or let your teammates down. But there were so many things and you were, you were on the cutting edge all the time, being the best of the best and training, training, training constantly. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't just that. It was going in and we had, you know, the people that were the operational folks and then the people that were support folks and then another layer in between that was like a direct support level of folks yeah. But to a person that was there, they all had to volunteer multiple times to reach that level. Yeah. And from the cooks to the mechanics to the, the people that were working at the medical clinic, every one of them were at the top of their game. And the idea was to support that level <clears throat> above that you needed to support to the, to the last person that was out there because of the mission that they were required to do. The objective was to make sure that those people that were out there that were doing things that seemed to be impossible by throwing themselves in harm wet, harm's way, 
that had to do these incredible tasks that were asked of them, that they didn't have anything else to worry about except what their mission was. So all the back end stuff from, you know, putting a uniform together to, you know, taking care of your family, all that was managed by that tremendous team that built out what was known as that, that place that we worked at. And it was, it was just, it was so incredible to see the drive and everybody had a positive attitude. Everybody was driving towards the same thing and everyone knew the criticality of the mission. And so what I wanted to create when I got out was I want to create the same type of environment, that same atmosphere, that camaraderie, that, you know, that there are no competitors out there, that everybody's simply looking at us and trying to keep up. We're not worried about looking in the rearview mirror because that's where we are out front all the time. Right. And everybody feels like that. And it was just, it was, it was simply an amazing thing. So that I, you know, generally speaking, that's what I was trying. That was the atmosphere I was trying to create because I realized that first of all, I'm a big dummy sitting at the top of a, of a company that is made up of phenomenal people. Why would you say you're a big dummy? Well, when you look at it, like I, I have people working for me that are, that are so intelligent that just, just make my head spin. I, I can't even remember some of the words that they say, you know, they're so, they're so intelligent. They're so bright and driven. And the only thing that I'm there for is to really help to create that environment and put them in a position to do what they're destined to do, which is these great, great things, you know? And so it, it's, I'm in awe by watching these people and what they're capable of doing and realizing that people are the most important thing. If you, if you, if you're, if the people that are part of an organization are unhappy or unhealthy or they don't get along with other people or they have a bad attitude, it infects the entire organization, which then causes you to not be as productive as you could be. And right. you have to realize that. And, but you have to understand the personal side of things. Why are, why are people like that? Understanding the person and, and their situation. Because in each person's mind, they're the most important person. Of course. Because they have to be. They got to take care of themselves first. So you, so you do have to understand that. And then you have to, you know, assist in building an environment and allowing them to express themselves and, and be trained in the areas that are going to drive them to reach the next level. And that's all a big part, I think, of, of I mean, that's doing elite, business. That's elite leadership. What you're describing. And that takes a whole different kind of intelligence to do it. <clears throat> it does. It does, but we enjoy doing it. Absolutely. It's fun. Well, Andy, thanks for coming in. That's an inspiring story hearing about how you built your business and what you what helped make you. That was that's a really cool story. I've never heard that story before from you. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I can see how that going through that experience would really help you understand that, like, man. I am one of, like, I was able to do something extremely, extremely hard because of my heart, because of my perseverance. And uh, sounds like pretty good exercise to help weed through the 250 chaff. It is. You know what's going to be great, though, Cord? What's that? Is really making Tampa the tech city of the future. You know, I think we're there. You know, it's going to happen. You can't, you can't have this many cybersecurity companies be here with all of that talent and not become a great tech city. Yeah, it's really fun. It's great that you're here. It's great that I'm here. It's great that we have the CEO council and everybody else is That's here right. and everybody's rowing in the same direction. Yeah, I think we are. This is definitely the, one of the, I mean, probably the best town in America to live in. Indeed. We just don't have those mountains like we have in Maine. No, we don't, but we can travel there if we need That's to. That's right. And then come vacation. home. That's exactly. Right. <laughs> well, thanks again for coming in, Andy. Where can people follow you and keep up with uh, what's going uh, on in the world? Sure. Quietprofessionals.com. You can definitely follow us on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and Facebook and Twitter and all the other fun social media uh, platforms. Um, I do most of my correspondence socially through, uh, through LinkedIn, but, um, uh, but certainly reach out anytime. I should have offered you a coffee. Not at all. Yeah, on your some. LinkedIn, you have <laughs> coffee every day. So. We do. We have a lot of gourmet coffee over at the building with some very high-end machines. If you want something better than Starbucks, come by for a visit. I'll definitely do that. Well, thanks for coming in again. And you can find us anywhere where podcasts are found on the Bake More Pie social feed as well as the Law of Relevancy feed. 
Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.